Let's continue with the testes and talk about their descent. Now, as a male is developing long before he's born, the testes actually start their development way up high in the abdominal cavity close to the kidneys. But of course, they've got to descend quite a distance. They've got to get out of this abdominal cavity if sperm cell production is ever going to occur. Now, as they descend, they're actually going to pass from the abdominal cavity through these inguinal canals. Those are going to be two little passageways in the front of the abdominal pelvic cavity on the male. And from there, they'll pass down into the scrotum, a hollow muscular container, which holds the testes. Now, the descent will be guided by a fibromuscular cord called the gubernaculum. Testes are going to pass through the inguinal rings. You'll see these bilateral oblique passageways in the front of the abdominal wall. There'll be openings in the aponeuroses of the transverse abdominus muscles, also the internal and external obliques. So those testes have to go through those muscles as well. Now, where they go through these muscles and these other structures, there's a weak part left in the abdominal wall. And that is why males are much more prone to hernias than females, because of those two weak spots in the front of that abdominal wall. Sometimes during uh, lifting, straining, something such as that, a little bit of intestine might pop down into those passageways. It could get constricted and cut off the blood flow. So if you ever hear of an inguinal hernia, that's where something's gotten into those inguinal rings on a male. Again, testes pass through them. They seal up pretty well, but not perfectly. Weak spots where something could get in them. Cryptocortism is the failure of one or both of those testes to descend <clears throat> out of the abdominal cavity and into the scrotum. And again, if they don't leave the abdominal cavity, sperm cells will be too warm. They'll never develop properly. Looking at sperm cell development. Now, they start off as spermatozoa inside the seminiferous tubules. At puberty, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone will be released, and that'll stimulate the release of luteinizing and follicle-stimulating hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone promotes the sperm cell production. You hear follicles in this chapter think reproductive cells. <clears throat> the follicle-stimulating hormone will promote the interstitial cells to produce large amounts of testosterone right along with the luteinizing hormone. The spermatogonia are going to divide and form the primary spermatocytes and the daughter spermatogonia. Now you take those primary spermatocytes, let them divide. There's where you start meiosis. Remember, mitosis <clears throat> always gives you complete copies of DNA in a cell, where meiosis always gives you half copies. So this will form the secondary spermatocytes. From there, those cells will divide, going through the second part of meiosis, to form spermatids. Here you go from 46 to 23 chromosomes. There's your half copy. The spermatids develop in a chromosome and flagella, as we saw in a previous video. And then there's those sustentacular Sertoli cells. Again, they help provide nutrients to the sperm cells, but they also form that blood testes barrier. They're very particular about what they'll allow into these developing cells. The interstitial cells, again, are where the testosterone comes from. And the sustentacular cells will convert that into dihydrotestosterone and a very tiny amount of estrogen. Looking back at the ducts, the efferent ductules lead out of the testes. Again, efferent always takes something out of an area. There's the epididymis on the outside of the testes. Again, that's where the sperm cells finish the last one or two days of the maturing process. The epididymis has a head, body, and tail to it, not much to its anatomy. And there's the stereocilia to the inside. Pseudostratified columnar epithelial layer increases surface area to facilitate the absorption of fluid from the inside of the duct. That's what the lumen is, always the hollow inside of a structure. There's the ductus or vas deferens. Now these pass from the epididymis on the outside of the testes, way back up in the abdominal cavity. The ductus, testicular artery, venous plexus, lymphatic vessels, nerves, and fibrous remains of the process vaginalis, part of the peritoneum, all form the spermatic cord. The distal end of the ductus deferens is enlarged as an ampulla, and the walls of the ductus deferens have smooth muscle that exhibit peristalsis during ejaculation. That's the contraction of smooth muscle, forcing the sperm cells and other materials out of the male at the time of ejaculation. Now, the ejaculatory duct is the joining of the ductus deferens, right, same as the vas deferens, and the seminal vesicles. So where those run together, 
That's where the ejaculatory duct comes from. Into the urethra is within that prostate gland. It's only one of these accessory glands of the male that's unpaired. Looking at the male urethra, it extends from the urinary bladder to the distal end of the penis. It's a passageway for urine and male reproductive fluids and cells. And there's three sections to the urethra in the male. The prostatic urethra, way back close to the bladder, passing through the prostate gland. So connected to the bladder, go see the prostate, ducts from there, go through the prostatic urethra. If that prostate gland becomes enlarged, which sometimes it does in males, it narrows the urethra. That's why they have trouble with urination. The membranous urethra extends through the perineum, the muscular floor of the pelvis, and then you've got the spongy or penile urethra. It passes through the body of the penis. There's several tiny mucus secreting urethral glands emptying out into the spongy urethra here. The penis itself functions with urination, serves a vehicle for injecting sperm into the vagina. An erection occurs when blood fills three different columns inside the penis. There are two columns called the corpora cavernosa and one the corpus spongiosum. So that's all about vasodilation of blood vessels into that area. There's the crua and bulb, which form the root of the penis. There's the glands, the distal enlarged end. It's actually part of the corpus spongiosum seen above. The prepuce or the foreskin covers the glands penis. It's removed at the time of circumcision. Erection again, vasodilation occurs through the use of nitric oxide and acetylcholine. Again, from the nervous system there, regulating the release of those chemicals. If you look here at some of these accessory organs of the male, there are two seminal vesicles. Can't see them both in this picture. One prostate, two bulbourethral, and two testes. That's seven glands total responsible for the production of all the sperm cells and all the other materials released with them at the time of ejaculation.